I want to ask you more about this. You said that the Scientologists also insist that this isn't your fault. Now, the classic Christian attitude towards your complex of problems is that the degree to which it's your fault is open, up, open for dispute. So let me give you an example of that. So imagine that you have a mother who's kind of overbearing and overprotective. And you're a six-year-old kid and you're, you didn't do your homework one day. And so you decide to feign illness to skip school. And your mother who's overbearing and overprotective, also hasn't pursued her own life, and she's lonesome. And so you tell her she's you're sick, but you're not, and she doesn't think you are, but she is just as happy if you're at home. And so you might say, well, that's the mother's fault because she's so damn overbearing, but it's also, to some degree, the kid's fault because he's looking for an easy out. And so, and this is what you do in good psychotherapy too, you know, like if I found out that you had a complex, the first thing I'd try to do is think, okay, well, what were the situational conditions that gave rise to that? Like maybe you had a very overbearing father. But I'd also want to find out, well, what temptations did you fall prey to, let's say, that increased the probability that you would develop that complex for reasons of your own? Those are called secondary gains. So for example, this is the secondary gain issue I'm curious about. You said that these... What did you call them? Engrams? These engrams, these engrams in the reactive mind, they're not your fault. See, you can see why that would be attractive, right? Because it enables you to place the responsibility for your suffering on someone else's, on someone or something else. And so I'm wondering what you think about that. Like, is that one of the things about Scientology that's particularly manipulative or there's a mercy in it, you know, and I mean, lots of people are abused by their parents and abused by society, and it's not surprising they're hurt, and it's not exactly their fault. So what do you think about that? The appeal and the attractiveness of being told that everything that's wrong with you is because of this thing, and you are not to blame for this thing. The attractiveness of that is why that is the message Scientology gives you at the introductory lower levels. This, that's So it's the bait. The switch is that as you progress in Scientology, you come to realize that actually, as a spiritual being, everything that happens to you, by you, by others, to others, is actually your fault. And to assume full responsibility, you have to understand how you are actually the prime cause for everything that has ever happened, including happened to you. And so uh, this is the difference between Dianetics and Scientology, actually. Um, Dianetics is supposed to be a mental science, and it's supposed to be the process of getting rid of these engrams. And then fast forward a couple of years after Erwin Hubbard started Dianetics, and then he started pursuing the spiritual angle, the religion angle. And so instead of trying to recall moments of pain and unconsciousness as early as, you know, prenatal incidents in the womb, all of a sudden people were remembering painful incidents of pain and unconsciousness from previous lives. And that opened the door to, oh, previous lives, what's happening here? The introduction of an immortal spiritual being. And then L. Ron Hubbard continued on with the religion angle and said, well, actually, as a spiritual being, you were the one creating your own reactive mind. And once you've gotten rid of your own reactive mind, L. Ron Hubbard introduces you to the confidential upper level materials, which is, by the way, you as a spiritual being, you're, uh, in Scientology, they call you a Thetan. You have now gotten rid of your own reactive mind. But now the reason why there's still things wrong with you is you have tens of thousands of other Thetans, spiritual beings, stuck to you as parasites, as entities on your body, all over your body. And those beings all have their own reactive mind. And those beings are, through some sort of, you know, spiritual connection, um, projecting onto you. You are experiencing their pains. You are experiencing their neuroses, psychoses, whatever, you know, anything that could be wrong with you. And so now you have to go through a years-long process of telepathically counseling, using the Scientology procedures, these entities, these beings, these thetans, to basically exercise them off of your body, wake them up so that they'll realize who they are, what they are, and go and pick up a new body at the local maternity ward and, and grow up to be a cleared individual and likely join Scientology. 
So this idea of getting rid of your reactive mind is something that's introduced to you at the very lowest levels and applies all the way up to the highest levels. It just switches from getting rid of your own reactive mind to getting rid of these entities' reactive minds. Oh, okay, okay. So, yeah. so let me take that apart in a couple of ways. So the first question I have there is, how is the switch from it's not your fault to it's your responsibility, how does that come about? And what's the rationale for that? It comes about when uh, you introduce the immortal spiritual um, Thetan, the immortal spirit into the equation. And L. Ron Hubbard's version of that is that about 65 trillion years ago, there was some sort of spiritual Big Bang when all spiritual entities that exist came into existence. You'd think he would talk a little bit more about this in Scientology, but he really doesn't. And, um, and that these spiritual entities are all natively godlike. And I'm not, not like the Christian God, but like, like uh, you know, ripping atmospheres off of galaxies, um, creating planets, destroying planets, creating universes. Like that, each in each spiritual entity here on Earth, me, you, we are natively godlike, and we're, we've basically we basically got so bored with our power that we wanted a more interesting game. So we decided to handicap ourselves in various ways and then just choose to forget that we had handicapped ourselves. Uh, we used to not even exist in a physical universe. There used to not be a physical universe. So we created a physical universe to have something that we could then trap ourselves in, to have some sort of a game that we could try to, uh, some sort of a trap that we could try to get out of to have this you know, interesting experience. Um, and without being too long-winded about this, it, it's basically when L. Ron Hubbard makes the jump from just trying to be a poor man's mental health care, like a mental therapy, Dianetics was supposed to be mental therapy, to going, okay, we're gonna slightly jump off from what we're pretending is a science. Now we're gonna get into religion and spiritual philosophy. We're gonna, um, and, and honestly, that was introduced by going into past lives. When you start going into past life memories, you have to talk about some entity that transcends death. And that becomes Scientology's Thetan, the soul, the spirit. Right. And well, okay. So, so there is, he is introduced. See, part of the reason that cults have such attractiveness is that they do harness archetypal ideas, right? Eternal religious ideas. That's a good way of thinking about it. Or patterns of attention and action that are intrinsic to, to what it means to be human. And there's clearly the introduction of a karma-like idea there, right? That that your destiny is a consequence of your your past choices. I mean, that's that's a, a tenet of Hinduism, obviously, and that you're playing out the consequences of this infinite array of choices extended over the longest possible period. And it's also the case that, see, and this is a very tricky issue. So Dostoevsky said, for example, that you're not only responsible for everything that you do and that everything that happens to you, but for everything that everyone else does and everything that happens to them, right? And that's well, that's a doctrine that's associated with the broadest possible conception of responsibility. And then the Buddha, now, when the Buddha hits enlightenment under the bow tree, he's offered the opportunity to stay in paradise forever, but, you know, eternally. And he rejects that because he believes that it would be inappropriate for him to occupy the paradisal state unless, ever, unless everyone was brought into the same state. You know, and so in many religious systems, there is a transition point that you might consider equivalent to the initiation into the religious enterprise that brings people beyond their local concerns, let's say, with their own destiny, and provides them with the insight, let's say, that they are in some sense ultimately responsible, right? And then God only knows what that ultimate responsibility means. Now, Hubbard concretized that and added a level of you know, a variety of levels of strange narrative overlay, um, including the idea of these thetans. But let's let's take that apart a little bit too. You know, you might think that you have your act together quite well. You know, let's just assume that you do as an autonomous individual. But then, you know, you, you're home for Christmas and you go see your family members and there's all sorts of unresolved issues around that 
within your family. And those are definitely affecting you in all sorts of ways, right? And then in the broader social community, you're going to be interacting with people who are possessed by one idea or another, and that's going to interfere with your movement forward. And so in some sense, there is no redemption for you in an absolute sense in the presence of the pathology, unresolved pathology of the past and of other people. And so it sounds to me like Hubbard concretized that idea with the notion of these Thetans. And so you said that they're, he conceptualized them as sort of stuck to you. And so can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Like, how did he conceptualize these, these Thetan-like beings? And what does it mean that they're intimately associated with you and that you have to also clear them? And how do you go about doing that? So this gets you know, into some things that have been widely ridiculed, fairly so, in places like South Park and other places on the internet. So at the lower levels of Scientology, the non-confidential levels, everyone's considered a, a, a Thetan. A Thetan is the primary animator of the body. It is the basically the prime mover, unmoved. Uh, we are, I'm a Thetan, you're a Thetan. A Thetan is something you are, not something you have. Okay. <clears throat> it's not until you get to the upper confidential levels of Scientology, that L. Ron Hubbard introduces this concept of a body Thetan and a Thetan cluster. And his explanation for what this is and how it came about is that, um, and by the way, Scientologists' conception of life in the galaxy is very much like Star Wars. Every planet or every star system has uh, intelligent uh, biological life, okay? So L. Ron Hubbard discussed this thing called the Galactic Federation, however many in this in this galaxy of however many planets that was composed of. There was this politician, um, Hubbard decided to give him a name, it's Zenu or Zemu. And he decided his system was too populated. So his plan to get rid of, you know, a good portion of the population was to call everybody in for tax audits under false pretense. And then when they showed up to freeze them in glycol and load them up on space planes and fly them to Earth and drop these people into volcanoes and blow them up with hydrogen bombs. Now, this incident was so severe. This was such an engram for them. And this happened about 76 million years ago. Of course, the volcanoes on Earth didn't exist 76 million years ago, but don't think about it too deeply. And this incident for these beings was so, uh, uh, you can't kill a Thetan, but it came about as close to it as you could. That has basically left these beings um, in this half dead, unconscious, you know, crazy state. And they're just blowing in the winds of Earth for the last 76 million years. And so then when, uh, you know, the human body uh, evolved through natural selection, which Scientologists are not opposed to necessarily, um, Hubbard had his own spin on evolution, but it doesn't necessarily contradict with natural selection. Uh, that when human bodies arrived here on Earth, uh, a fresh set of Thetans that were not exposed to the volcano incident. A fresh set of Thetans were rounded up and dropped off to this planet so that this planet could be a prison planet. And L. Ron Hubbard says that if you're on this planet, you were a troublemaker, you were a rebel, you were a, an artist, you were someone who couldn't be controlled. The system wanted to, uh, didn't like you, thought you were gonna uh, help overthrow the system one day. Maybe you're like the hippies, spiritual hippies. <laughs> And, and so L. Create, create, uh, L. Ron Hubbard creates this explanation that this is a prison planet, that we are basically doomed to live lifetime after lifetime after lifetime with our memories being wiped in the B Between Lives implant station. And that the fact that we live, uh, we believe we live single lives. Uh, for the most part, most people on earth are not spiritual or religious. We believe we came from mud. Uh, L. Ron Hubbard was very much... Um, uh, he hates psychiatry, psychiatrists, psychology, uh, Darwin, you know, the, anything, anything opposed to spirituality, Hubbard, you know, later on claimed to be absolutely against. And so, uh, and even Hubbard would even say that the religious people on earth who, uh, according to Hubbard, have been pre-programmed by our alien captor overlords, sort of spiritually programmed to invent these stories, the world's major religions, to sort of keep us occupied and to keep us from uh, realizing that earth is a prison and to keep us from uh, seeking a way to get out of the prison and that even the religions of earth serve the purpose of helping to keep the, the, the population of earth trapped, 
trapped spiritually. 